Well, good morning and welcome to our virtual life group lesson. Today we are uh, touching on a difficult subject for some people and it's the title uh, is Hell Real? Uh, the reality of hell and we're going to be looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you want to go to the New Testament, very close to the back of the book, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to be reading several verses out of 2 Thessalonians and then we're going to uh, delve into the realities of hell, the scriptural, biblical realities of hell. Um, some people deny hell. They deny that there is such a place as hell. They deny that there is uh, any kind of eternal punishment for the wicked. And the reality or the denial of the reality of hell, excuse me, is connected to atheism. You say, well, wait a minute, how, how is that? Well, not all people who deny hell are atheists, but there is a connection between the two because both of them are based on uh, the idea of naturalism. Naturalism is simply the belief that all there is is what is natural, the natural world, physical matter. So in other words, if I can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, or hear it, it's real, it's natural. Anything that I cannot see, taste, touch, feel, or hear is not real, it just doesn't exist. So atheists use that to say, well, we can't, we can't sense or feel or experience God or heaven or anything of the afterlife, and therefore we have no uh, justification to believe that those things are real. They just don't exist. The only thing that exists is what is physical, what I can uh, experience with my five senses. And so <clears throat> denying hell doesn't necessarily carry you as far as atheism, but it is connected in the sense that I can't see hell. I can't, I can't experience it in this lifetime. So it's easy for me to simply just discard it and say it's just not real. And believe it or not, there are many people who claim to be Christians who claim that there is no such place as hell. Um, and to be honest with you, that's a, that's a, um, that's a, that's a comforting thought for a lot of people to just dismiss it and say it just isn't there. And then I don't have to deal with it. I don't have to experience the consequences of it. I don't have to worry about my loved ones, my friends, my family members who might go there. I don't have to worry about myself going there. I'll just say that it doesn't exist. Um, and I would say if you are someone who has nothing to do with Christ, you do not want to be in a right relationship with God, you don't believe in the Bible, then go ahead and believe whatever you want, okay? It doesn't matter at this point if you've denied Christ. There's nothing that I can do to convince you or to change your mind. If you claim to be a Christian, you have to go to the biblical authority. You have to go look at the Bible. That is the Word of God. If you claim to be a Christian, you can't dismiss what the Bible has to say. So we're going to look at that. But let me just explain to you, if the world that the atheists and the naturalists believe in is real, if there is such a world, and this is such a world, if this is a world where only what is natural uh, exists, and there is no supernatural, there is nothing beyond what is the physical world, okay? Let's just assume for a moment that's right. What are the actual implications of that? Well, that means there's no God. There's no Son, there's no Savior, there is no Holy Spirit. There is no God, because God is supernatural. He is not natural, he was not created. So if there is nothing supernatural, there's no God. There's no life beyond death, okay? You live this life, you die, your physical body dies, that's all there is to it. Likewise, there's no human soul. There is no eternal part of you that goes on somewhere else. It just, that just doesn't exist in that world, okay? There's no such thing as a miracle. They do not happen, okay? There are no angels. There are no demons, okay? Um, if there is no spiritual aspect to life, if everything is just physical matter and there is nothing spiritual or supernatural, then there's no such thing as morality. There's no such thing as what is evil or what is good, okay? Those are just determined by the physical people. We decide what we think is moral or just 
but there is no actual righteousness. There's no basis for morality. There's no such thing as sin. Those things don't exist. And if we are just physical matter hurling around uh, in space and there is nothing um, spiritual about us, then there's no purpose in life. There's no meaning in life. Nothing matters. I mean, that's the, that is the moral implication of naturalism. Nothing matters ultimately. Nothing. So, out of that, you have some people who want to take a middle road. And so they say, yes, I'm a Christian. I believe in the supernatural. I believe in God. I believe in Christ. I just don't believe in hell, okay? So there's two different ways that people try to uh, ride the fence. One of them is the idea of universalism or universal salvation. This idea that at the end of all time, God is just gonna give in and say, oh, come on, I'm just, everybody gets to go to heaven. Yeah, I was just kidding. Everybody will go to heaven somehow, some way. Uh, people who believe in reincarnation believe uh, in universalism because that's why they say, well, if you don't do well in your, in your first life, you may come back in another life and have a chance to fix what you did wrong. And, you know, may have to go through that several times, but eventually you'll be good enough. There is another theory that people use to try and... Um, marry what they want to what they say they believe. And that is the idea of annihilism. And you know what it means to annihilate something. You just make it disappear. Just You just demolish it so that it's uh, blown to smithereens. And so there is this idea that, yes, there is maybe uh, punishment. People go to hell, but eventually God will just annihilate all of the wicked and they just won't exist anymore. Okay. So we're going to blow those two theories out of the water with the Bible. But I want you to be aware, those are, those are the two prevailing theories that people use who want to say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I just can't believe in hell, okay? So let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul here is writing, he says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. Okay, he's saying that you're, what you're going through right now is evidence that God's judgment is right. He says, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. You are suffering for the kingdom. He says, God is just. That's a very important understanding. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. He's saying, when Jesus comes back in his full glory, there will be no more excuses. There will be no more uh, second chances. That's it. God's done at that point. When Jesus comes back in full glory, in blazing fire with powerful angels, he's going to wipe out everybody who has been opposed to him. But then he goes on and explains something else. He says, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's heavy stuff right there. 
Um, what is he telling you? He's saying that God is a just God. He has to uh, deal with sin. He has to deal with wickedness. If God could simply pretend wickedness wasn't there, would that be justice? Think about it how you live your life. You live with a legal system, and if you're like me, you get frustrated when you see the legal system fail. When you see somebody who gets caught doing something and because of some technicality, they just walk away and they get off scot-free. Or somebody murders someone and confesses to it or the evidence is overwhelming and yet because a judge or a jury simply feels sorry for them for some reason, they say, oh, well, you know, he probably shouldn't be punished too much. And so they get away with it or they get a very light sentence and you just, your blood boils and you say, this is wrong. People should not be able to do such evil and then just walk away and act like it didn't happen. They shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. How many times have you said, well, if that happened to me, if I'm the one that did that, they'd put me under the jail. What you're saying is there is a sense of justice within you, and when that justice is not satisfied, it bothers you. And yet, people will say, but God should just overlook sin. He should just forget about it. Pretend it isn't there. Why would we want God to be that way when we ourselves are not that way? And the reason that we have a sense of justice is because we live in a world that is not just a natural world. It is a world with a spiritual realm where God, the supernatural God, has a sense of justice and morality. And we intrinsically know that it is real and we follow it to the best of our ability because we know on the inside there is right and wrong. And we know that the basis of morality is God himself. And so we as Christians try our best to live according to that, to live up to that. So let's go and look at this eternal punishment. Let's look at hell itself. Let's dive in for just a few minutes. The word hell is an English word, okay? So when you look at your English translation and you see the word hell, um, it sometimes... Um, it means different things. So I want you to understand, if you go back to the Hebrew, go to the Old Testament, the word there that is rendered hell is the word Sheol. And that's something that I've explained before. We've talked about it. And Sheol in the Old Testament does not necessarily mean just a place of punishment, but it means a place for the dead. So Sheol in the Old Testament is an understanding of when you physically die, you're, you go somewhere. Your soul goes to another location, and that is Sheol. Um, the Greek word for that is Hades, okay? So when you read hell, Hades, Sheol, you're most of the time talking about the same place, okay? You're just talking about it in different languages, now, Jesus explained that Old Testament state of Sheol in Luke chapter 16. You remember this story. He talks about this rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus was a godly, righteous man, but a very poor man, a beggar. But when he died, he went to Sheol and he went to the Abraham bosom side but when the rich man, who was an unrighteous man, who did not honor God, when he died, he also went to Sheol, but he went to the hell side, the, uh, the torment side of Sheol. And I say the hell side because people have come to associate hell with punishment. But the idea of Sheol is that there is this place, and uh, when the rich man saw a long way off, he saw Lazarus in Abraham's uh, presence and he spoke and he asked, I'm paraphrasing, you can go back to Luke chapter 16 and read it. He asked Abraham, could, could you send uh, Lazarus over here, just dip his finger in some water and just do something about this torment. He's alive, being tormented, and he's talking to Abraham, and Abraham explains to him, no, he can't come over there. No, you got your good things while you were on the earth, but apparently you didn't want to have anything to do with God, and so this is, this is where you have to be. And 
Lazarus can't come over there anyway because there's a chasm that divides us. There's a great gulf that divides us so he can't cross over to you and you can't cross over to him. And Jesus did not speak of this as if it was just some kind of a parable or something. He spoke of it as if this is a reality. This is a true story. This is how it occurred. So Christ Jesus himself explained this to us. Now, most Bible scholars, and I am one of those who agree with them, most Bible scholars believe that at the resurrection of Jesus, he went and emptied Abraham's bosom and took those people up to heaven. And you say, well, why couldn't they have gone straight up to heaven to begin with? Well, because Jesus at that point had not yet shed his atoning blood. And so these people, even though they were counted as righteous by the grace and the righteousness of Christ, before Christ actually shed his blood, they could not enter the holiness of heaven. He had to shed his blood for those old covenant saints who were counted as righteousness, but he had to physically shed his blood and atone for those sins before they could then enter into the holy presence of heaven. And so that side of Sheol, in my best understanding of the scripture, was empty. But the torment side was left there, and that is where people to this day go. Now, after the resurrection, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that to be uh, absent from the bodies, to be present from the Lord. We no longer, as Christians, have to go to Abraham's bosom. Abraham would be in heaven. So we go directly to heaven. But those who die without Christ would still go to Sheol and still go to the torment side of the chasm. Now, there is another word that is sometimes rendered hell in the New Testament, but if you go back to the Greek, it is the word Gehenna. And Gehenna appears at least 12 times in the New Testament, 11 of those in the Gospels, one time, I think, in the book of James. And the word Gehenna comes from the Hebrew Gehenon, or you've heard of this, the Valley of Hinnon. It was an actual physical valley there outside of Jerusalem. It was a perpetually burning trash heap, um, but not just a place for people to get rid of their household refuse. It was also a place where they would cast dead bodies. If someone died and they couldn't afford to bury them, or if someone was a criminal who was executed or crucified, throw the body into Gehenna, into the valley. It was just a burning nasty cauldron of, it was like a landfill that was on fire. People at one point, Jewish people, got so deranged that they would actually sacrifice their children to Moloch by throwing their live babies into the fire and sacrifice them to this demonic entity. Um, Jeremiah prophesied about this valley and prophesied that it would someday be called a valley of slaughter, that God would use it symbolically or literally to be a place of punishment. And the New Testament uses Gehenna and uses the adjective, um, excuse me, it uses the word Gehenna and it, and it always means eternal hell okay? Everlasting fire. It is never used in the term of a holding place. It is not a temporary place. This is a word that is used for the eternal hell. So think about it. You have right now Christians who have left this earth. They have died physically and gone to heaven. And they are in heaven with Christ Jesus. You have people who have died without Christ who have gone to Sheol. But one day, all of Sheol, all of that eternal, all of that, um, sorry, I'm tongue-tied, all of that torture side of Sheol will be emptied into Gehenna, the lake of fire. Hell itself will be thrown into there. So when you read Gehenna, and you probably won't because your, your Bible probably translates it 
hell, but it always means eternal fire, eternal hell, an eternal place. In fact, it is the word that Jesus used in Matthew 5, 29, when he said, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. So if hell is not a real place, somebody needs to tell Jesus because he talked a lot about it. Um, every time Gehenna is used in the gospels, it's connected to something Jesus himself is saying. So if, if, if you encounter somebody who says, yes, I'm a Christian, I just don't believe hell is a real place, you can very politely say, well, you need to talk to Jesus about it because he doesn't know. And if you want to get into the actual, the, the wording and the scholarly uh, study of the languages and explain to them the, the word Gehenna and how Jesus used it over and over again to speak of this eternal hell and this eternal destruction, you can go there if you want to. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about eternal punishment. Okay, so the scripture is very clear that sin will be punished. You can find that everywhere from Genesis to Revelation. There is nothing in the scripture to indicate that God will simply forget about sin, overlook sin. I mean, if, if, if you read the Bible, you know sin will be punished because God is a just God. He has to deal with it, okay? The New Testament uses an adjective, and it's A-I-O-N, and I'm not sure exactly the best pronunciation of it, but uh, my Greek pronunciation sometimes is not very good, but I'd say aeon, which means the age to come. So this is an adjective that means the future age, that eternal age. Now, there is a derivative of that that is a-i-o-n, i-o-n, aeonion, and that means everlasting or eternal. That's the same word that is used to describe God being everlasting or eternal, okay? So I want you to understand the New Testament uses the same adjective to explain how God is eternal that it uses to explain how there is a punishment that is also eternal. It never ends. Um, Jesus referred to this uh, eternal hell as a place where the fire never goes out, okay? Just stop and think about that for a moment. He says the fire never goes out. The worm does not die. The fire is never quenched. Okay, so Jesus himself used language and wording explaining the eternality of this punishment, this punishment of Gehenna. It doesn't stop. Okay, so there's no such thing as annihilationism, that's a long word, excuse me, where they have to go to hell, but they're just uh, consumed by it and they just poof, seem to cease to exist. That's a popular belief among people who claim to be Christians that uh, they're just, if you don't make it to heaven, yeah, you'll have a little blip in hell, but you'll just be annihilated and you won't exist anymore. You're not, as they teach, you're not going to be uh, punished eternally. They say, no, that's, that's not real. Again, if that's not real, somebody needs to tell Jesus because he claims it's real. He talks about it. He warns us of it. He's very clearly telling us that there is an eternal punishment. In fact, there's a lot, there are a lot of other phrases used to describe how this punishment is eternal and they're tragic. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's nothing good about weeping and gnashing of teeth. Words like condemned to hell, the judgment of hell, beaten with many blows, perishing, lost, destruction over and over and over again, these words that describe this eternal punishment of hell, there's not a clear reference anywhere in the New Testament to indicate there's an end to this punishment. Even though people teach it and they try to find scripture to, to base it on, there's nowhere, anywhere in the New Testament that indicates that this punishment ends at some point. Now, if if it does, if there's an end to it, if it's just a short little punishment and then you're just poof, you don't exist anymore, you would think Jesus would have explained that to us rather than mislead us into thinking that it was eternal. But Jesus is quite clear that this is an eternal punishment. So this idea of annihilationism, 
or universal salvation. Either one of those is just, at, at best, it's just speculation, and at worst, it's wishful thinking. But it's not biblical. Neither one of those theories is biblical, and yet they're very, very common. Um, interestingly enough, neither, neither of these was ever uh, popular up until 1900s, probably. Um, especially the, the idea of universal salvation that just everybody eventually will be saved. Those are, those are things that were never really taught in the early church or even in the middle ages of the church. These are things that did not become popular until the last hundred years or so. Why do you think? Well, my theory, the closer we get to the end, the more Satan tries to convince people, don't worry about it, hell's not real. Hell's not real. And even if it is, it's just going to be just a little blip and you're going to be annihilated. And Why do you think people are so flippant about it? Like, hey, I don't mind going to hell. Everybody else I know is going to be there. May as well go down there and have a party. Or, you know, or they think they're just going to be consumed by the fire and they won't exist anymore. And it's like, so what? At least I won't be bored in heaven for millions and millions of years sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Okay. I hear people say stuff like that. Number one, they haven't studied the Bible because they don't understand the reality of hell. Second, they haven't studied the Bible because they don't understand that that's not what heaven is about. It's not you sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Uh, it is a culture. It is a working, thriving, dynamic culture uh, where people live, um, uh, engage in useful and productive things, and it, it is not at all like they are describing it. And the concept of time is very, very different in eternality. In the eternal state, you don't have the concept of this watch and the constant ticking of the watch. And you don't have that. There's no night. Um, you're not watching the days and counting the months and the year. It's not like that. Um, but if you don't know the Bible very well, you can just make up whatever you want and claim it and, and hold on to it. But the reality is, Jesus taught us very differently. So there are some objections to hell, and I actually pulled these out of the literature. Some of the things that you may hear from other people that say, well, I just don't believe in hell, and here's why. Number one, they say a loving God would not send people to hell. Okay, God, in my humble opinion, could literally do no more than what he has done to, send, to show people how to avoid this punishment. The Bible has made it clear that through just his creation, God has made his, his existence known to everyone. And the Bible makes it very clear that those who seek his face, those who call upon him, he will respond. How will he respond? I am convinced that if you are uh, part of a people group living somewhere in the deepest part of the Amazonian jungle, and you've never heard the name of Jesus, but you look up at the stars at night, you look at the sun and the moon and the stars, and you look at the creation, and you look at what God has created, and you say, I know you're there. I may not even know your name, but I know you're there. I know you're holy. I know you are righteous. I know that you are all powerful, and I know you are eternal. You are not created. In other words, I know you are not natural. You are supernatural. The Bible clearly tells us in Romans chapter 1, every human being knows that just by what God has created. I am utterly and totally convinced that if you get to that point where you acknowledge God and the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it is the beginning of your salvation when you recognize and you hold God Almighty in reverent awe. And I am convinced that when you seek that God, however he needs to save you, if he needs to send somebody there to tell you about Jesus Christ, his Savior, he'll call somebody to get on a boat or a plane or hike to where you are and tell you about Christ Jesus. He will not leave you there while you are praying and talking to him and say, well, it's too bad. There's nobody there to tell him about Jesus. I guess he'll have to go to hell. 
I don't find that in the scripture. I find that those who call upon the Lord will be saved, that those who look to God and acknowledge the existence of God, that God will respond to that in kind, okay? So I don't think there's anybody who has an excuse, and Paul didn't either, because he said there is no man with an excuse. Nobody will get to get to heaven and say, well, God, I didn't know you were real. If I'd known you were real, I would have looked, I would have talked to you, I would have prayed to you, I would have honored you, I would have sought you and, and figured out how to be saved. Paul says nobody has an excuse. Some people say, well, I can't imagine a lake of fire, a literal lake of fire. I can't either. I don't, I don't understand uh, liquid fire. I know that in theory it is possible. And I also can't imagine uh, literal creation. I can't imagine what that was like when God said, let there be light and poof, it exists. I can't imagine a lot of things. I can't imagine miracles. I have a hard time imagining angels. Do I know they're real? Yeah, I know they're real. Is creation real? Yes, I know it's real. Just because I can't imagine it or I can't fathom it in my brain, just because I can't understand it, doesn't mean that it is real. Anybody who's arrogant enough to say, well, I just can't imagine a literal lake of fire, I would say, well, how can you even imagine God in all of his glory if you haven't actually seen him yet? The Bible tries to explain it to us a little bit, but even then it comes up short. There's a third thing. People say, well, I believe that death is the end of it all. There's nothing after that. Okay, um, that, that can be your stance. It's a pretty strong stance because you're basically saying, I'm going to bet everything on there being nothing other than the physical world. Um, if you're wrong, you've got a serious problem, okay? And you're not only denying uh, the reality of, of the afterlife, you're denying the reality of God, you're denying everything that your senses actually tell you is real. Some people say, well, nobody's bad enough to deserve that kind of punishment. Nobody is bad enough to deserve hell like that. Oh my goodness, let's, let's unpack that one. I could decide who's good enough and who's bad enough based on myself. I could use myself as a benchmark. I could say, well, this is how good I am. And anybody who's better than me or as good as me, they probably can go to heaven. And anybody who's not as good as me, they, they may not get to go. Or I could say, based on who I am, everybody's pretty good and they're all good enough to go. I mean, who gets to decide who's good enough and who's not good enough? I might think I'm a pretty good person. But that's, that's if I don't recognize the holiness of God. God is a holy, righteous God. He's perfect. He's flawless. And the scripture says, compared to him, my very best righteousness is like filthy rags. So it's very arrogant to say, well, nobody's bad enough to deserve hell. Nobody, nobody's that bad. Well, what is your measuring stick? What, how do you determine what's good and what's bad? There's a, some of the objections that, that people offer, and you can refute that from a philosophical point of view. You can refute that biblically. Especially if they claim to be Christians, you can say, well, let's look at the scripture. What does the Bible actually say? The Bible is very clear. There is a place of punishment and a place of eternal punishment. And that those who reject Christ Jesus and ultimately are rejecting the Father, that's where they go. That's not the way I would like for it to be. That's not what I wish it was. I wish it didn't have to be that way. In fact... I'm not the only one. God says very clearly that he does not want anyone to perish. God does not want anyone to perish. It's not his will that you have to be punished. That is not what he wants for you. It's not what he wants for your loved ones. It's not what he wants for your neighbors. It's not what he wants for your kids, your grandkids, your mom, your dad, your sisters. Your... He does not want that for you or anybody around you. 
That's not what God wants. We try to blame God. People try to blame God and say, well, he shouldn't punish people, okay? God has made it so evident that he is here. And he has simply said, would you look for me? I'm here. I'm not far from you. Acts chapter 26 or Acts chapter 17, I can't remember, forgive me. Paul said it very clearly. God's not far from any of us. He wants to be sought after. He wants to be looked for. He wants you looking for him. That's why he's created in such an incredible, glorious way that you would look up, you would look out, that you would see the natural world and you say, there's something about this natural world that is supernatural, must be God. Let's find him. God wants to be found because God wants fellowship with you and God wants you in heaven with him forever. He doesn't want you to be punished. Please, please, please don't make the mistake of blaming God when people reject him and choose for themselves their eternal punishment. That's not God's choice. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are gracious and you are merciful. Help us, Father, to realize how urgently we need to go out and share our faith with others, that we need to plead with people to consider God, to look for him, to seek him out, to seek his wisdom, to hold him in reverential awe, Lord God, to seek out the Savior of Jesus Christ. We ask that you would help us, Father, in that endeavor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. In the meantime, if, you are, if you're watching this and you're able to come to church um, Sunday morning, we have a special Thanksgiving service at 10 o'clock, and then we have our 5 o'clock Thanksgiving meal, and that is for the entire church, and we're going to have a wonderful time, and we're going to gobble till we wobble, as they say. We're going to eat and enjoy ourselves. God bless you and have a wonderful week.